Well, good morning. You know, the, the pulpit's a little bit different than it was at camp. There was a man who walked into a hotel on a business trip. Walks into the hotel and he says, excuse me, do you have any rooms? The man says, yes. So he, he paid for his room. The man said, you go up the staircase around the corner, up the staircase around the corner, up the staircase around the corner. So the man went up the staircase around the corner, up the staircase around the corner, up the staircase around the corner, and went to bed. Another man walks into the hotel and he says, excuse me, do you have any rooms? He says, why, yes, we do. And so after he paid, he went up the staircase around the corner, up the staircase around the corner, up the staircase around the corner. Third man comes in and says, excuse me, sir, do you have any rooms? He says, well, of course we do. And after he paid, the man said, you go up the staircase around the corner, up the staircase around the corner, up the staircase around the corner. So the man grabbed his bags, went up the staircase around the corner, up the staircase around the corner, realized he forgot the room key, came down the staircase around the corner, down the staircase around the corner, grabbed his room key, went up the staircase around the corner, up the staircase around the corner, up the staircase around the corner, and went to bed. Morning comes. First man comes down the staircase around the corner, down the staircase around the corner, down the staircase around the corner, and says, excuse me, do you guys have breakfast here? And he says, of course we do. You go down the staircase around the corner, down the staircase around the corner, down the staircase around the corner. So the man went down the staircase around the corner, down the staircase around the corner, down the staircase around the corner, and ordered ham and eggs. Second man said, got up, ah, stretched. Went down the staircase around the corner, down the staircase around the corner, down the staircase around the corner. You guys can probably say this with me. Across the lobby, went down the staircase around the corner, down the staircase around the corner, down the staircase around the corner to get his own breakfast because he knew where it was and ordered him an eggs. Third man comes down the staircase around the corner, down the staircase around the corner, down the staircase around the corner and says, Excuse me, do you have breakfast here? And he says, Why, yes, we do. You go down the staircase around the corner, down the staircase around the corner, down the staircase around the corner. So he went down the staircase around the corner, down the staircase around the corner, down the staircase around the corner and ordered cereal, Fruit Loops. First man finishes his nice ham and eggs, gets up, up, goes up the staircase around the corner, up the staircase around the corner, up the staircase around the corner, crosses the lobby, goes up the staircase around the corner, up the staircase around the corner, up the staircase around the corner, grabs his bags, comes down the staircase around the corner, down the staircase around the corner, down the staircase around the corner, and leaves. Second man up the staircase around the corner, up the staircase around the corner, up the staircase around the corner. Crosses the lobby, goes up the staircase around the corner, up the staircase around the corner, up the staircase around the corner, gets his bags, goes down the staircase around the corner, down the staircase around the corner, down the staircase around the corner, and leaves. Third man, up the staircase around the corner, up the staircase around the corner, realizes, ah, I left my wallet sitting on the table. Comes down the staircase around the corner, down the staircase around the corner, grabs his wallet, goes up the staircase around the corner, up the staircase around the corner, up the staircase around the corner, crosses the lobby, goes up the staircase around the corner, up the staircase around the corner, up the staircase around the corner. Comes down the staircase around the corner, down the staircase around the corner, realizes he left his teddy bear on the bed, goes up the staircase around the corner, up the staircase around the corner, grabs his teddy bear, comes down the staircase around the corner, down the staircase around the corner, down the staircase around the corner, and leaves. Now, do you know what the point of that was? Do you realize that when Americans travel and stay in hotels, two out of three of them order ham and eggs for breakfast? <laughs> Uh, come on. Now, you say, Pastor John, why would you tell us such an annoying and long and bad joke? Reason? I don't know. Because I'm among friends. And I know that you guys are not going to throw, hopefully, not going to throw anything at me. You're not going to come up and mob me and take me to the ground and beat me up, etc. I'm safe to share my opinion and my bad jokes. But as a Christian, we will not always have that luxury. We will not always have the luxury of only being with friends who will accept what we have to say and what we believe. Sometimes as Christians... We're going to face enemies. We're going to face people who don't like what we believe and definitely don't want to hear what we have to share with them. Before we get into that, 
Let's pray. Father God, I want to thank you for your amazing love for us. I want to thank you, God, that here in this sanctuary we are among friends. We can freely worship you. We can freely talk to you. We can freely, freely seek your face. And it's just not that way around the world. In many, many different places. We ask your protection in those places. In those people, your people, Lord. And we ask that as we explore your word today, that you will open it up for us. That we'll be able to see clearly what you have for us. In Christ's name. Our memory verse today is Psalms 23.5. It says, You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil and my cup overflows. And that comes from the 23rd Psalm, which is probably, probably the most well-known psalm, but definitely the one that is probably the most comforting as well. You know, some of it... Some of it is not comfortable, like the valley of the shadow of death. It's not exactly a comfortable thing uh, in that psalm. Yet the message is really clear. Let's take just a second to go through it. Listen to it again. It starts out, it says, the Lord is my shepherd. Do you know what that means? That means that God guides us. God guides us. He takes care of us. He shepherds us along in the way. And then it says, I shall not want, means basically that I lack nothing. I have everything I need. It says, he makes me to lie down in green pastures. For sheep, that's pretty important. Because that's where the good food is. That's where the rest is for the weary lives. It says, he leads me beside the still waters. Once again, for a sheep, sheep don't swim. The wool, etc., gets clogged with water, and if the water is too rough, they drown. But he leads me beside still waters. Waters where I can, I can come and be protected and, and not have to worry. He says he restores my soul, and he leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. It's all around me, right? I will fear no evil because you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they come with me. The rod was used to protect against wolves and bears and things like that, lions. The staff with its hook was used to rescue when the, the sheep would get into trouble, get into an area where the shepherd couldn't easily go. He could reach down and pull the sheep back with his staff. So the rod and the staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Think about that for a second. No matter what's going on around us, no matter how many enemies are around us, <coughs> God prepares a table for us where we can sit and we can be in His presence and we can get refreshment without worrying. It says, you anoint my head with oil. Back in those days, they anointed the head with oil of the sheep for one, for healing, like if there was a minor wound or something like that. But also, anointing the head with oil would sometimes keep like the insects and everything from biting them, etc. Keep it off of them. And it says, my cup runs over. In other words, I have so much. I have so much. I have every, my cup is so full. It's overflowing with blessings. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. It's amazing words, an amazing comfort for us as we think of what God does for us and how much He is there for us. Yes, the message is clear. God guides and He cares for us always. Yet. Yet. That doesn't mean we will always be sent somewhere pleasant and safe. Remember, there's a valley of shadow of death here. God 
God cares for us, but doesn't necessarily keep us in some kind of protective bubble. Some place where no one's going to get to us. Where we're never going to be challenged. God puts us in situations where we can grow and we can help others grow, where we can witness, where we can be used. But that doesn't mean it's going to be safe. It doesn't mean it's going to be someplace where we're going to say, oh, this is pleasant, I can just kick back. You know, the problem with kicking back, you don't grow. You don't grow. I mean, you go to the gym, right? You don't go to the gym to sit on a lounge chair. Hey, I'm in the gym now. I'm working out on my abs. No. You get on the machines, you get to use the weights, etc. It's hard, you sweat, you challenge yourself. So you can grow. That's what life's about. And God will lead us into areas where we will be challenged, where we will have to grow. And those times, those challenges can be tough, they can be painful. Following God may put us in enemy territory. They put us in enemy territory. I have great respect for missionaries who end up going to places that we call restricted access countries. Having been a missionary for many, many years and in Africa and Japan, etc., I, I came encounter, I encountered these people. I, I ended up talking with them or I knew them or it was something that I knew of them from other colleagues, etc. I have great respect for them. They go there and they go into a country and to share, to distribute a Bible, to teach others. I mean, they're taking their lives in, you know, in their hands. It's, it's dangerous. But believers in those countries, too, in some ways they have it a lot worse. Because they can't go anywhere. Believers in those countries, in restricted access countries, they live on a daily reminder that their faith has to be real. Because otherwise, otherwise, how are they going to be sustained when the world is trying to crash down on them? When others are trying to squash what they believe? You know, many people in this room come from another place. And I'm not telling you anything new. Many of you might be, let's say if you're Malaysian, you know, to be Chinese, ethnically Chinese Malaysian means that for you to become a Christian, eh, there's a lot of other Chinese Christians. But what about Malays? How many Malay Christians do you know? Does that mean no Malay Christians? They're, they don't exist? No, they exist. Because their culture, their government says to be Malay means you have to be Muslim. You cannot be Christian. And so for them to profess Christ is putting their life on the line. You know, Paul is a missionary heading back to Jerusalem. He can relate, can he? God is sending him back to a place that wants to kill him. He's been mobbed. The mob is beating him. He's been arrested, which actually probably saved his life. And we pick up our story in Acts 22, 30 through 23, 11. And it says this. The commander wanted to find out exactly why Paul was being accused by the Jews. So the next day he released him and ordered the chief priests and all the members of the Sanhedrin to assemble. Then he brought Paul and had him stand before them. The Sanhedrin is his council, right? The Jewish council, the leaders. Paul looked straight at the Sanhedrin and he said, My brothers, I have fulfilled my duty to God in all good conscience to this day. At this the high priest Ananias ordered those standing near Paul to strike him on the mouth. Then Paul said to him, God will strike you, you whitewashed wall. You sit, I mean, you know, Paul doesn't mince words, does he? You know, he's like, oh, it's not really, no. God will strike you, you whitewashed wall. You sit there to judge me according to the law. 
Yet you yourself violate the law by commanding that I be struck. Those who were standing there Paul, near Paul said, How dare you insult God's high priest? Paul replied, Brothers, I did not realize that he was the high priest. For it is written, Do not speak evil about the ruler of your people. Before we go on further into that, by the way, a lot of interpreters go, How could Paul not realize this was the high priest? You know, I think Paul's being sarcastic here. I think Paul is like, You know, A, this guy is really not fulfilling his role. Because he is breaking the law by doing this. You know, you're not supposed to treat prisoners like that. And how can you be the high priest if you're acting like this? You know, it's not that Paul's ignorant. It's Paul is like, eh. all right. Then Paul, knowing that some of them were Sadducees and others Pharisees, called out in the Sanhedrin, My brothers, I'm a Pharisee, descended from Pharisees. I stand on trial because of the hope of the resurrection of the dead. When he said this, a dispute broke out between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the assembly was divided. The Sadducees say that there is no resurrection, and that there are neither angels nor spirits. But the Pharisees believe all these things. There was a great uproar, and some of the teachers of the law who were Pharisees stood up and argued vigorously, We find nothing wrong with this man, they said. What if a spirit or an angel has spoken to him? The dispute became so violent the commander was afraid Paul would be torn to pieces by them. He ordered the troops to go down and take him away from them by force and bring him into the barracks. The following night, the Lord stood near Paul and said, Take courage. As you testified about me in Jerusalem, so you must also testify in Rome. You know, Paul has had a busy couple of days so far, hasn't he? He really has. <laughs> He's been beaten. He's been mobbed. Everywhere he goes, the, you know, the Jews erupt and they're ready to tear him limb from limb. It's a terrible thing. What's ironic, though, is that Paul, the missionary, who's been going to various places and, and been stoned and, and gone through all these troubles, he's actually come home. Jerusalem is his home. Right? And yet, this is how he's being treated. Look at, I'm, I'm going to read to you, actually. I'm going to read to you Acts 22, 1 through 5. We've already uh, looked at it earlier, uh, a few weeks ago. But it says here, Brothers and fathers, listen to my defense. When they heard him speak in Aramaic, they became very quiet. Do you remember? I don't know if I talked about that when we, when we went through it. Do you know why they became quiet? Aramaic was the common language. These are Jews. I mean, Latin is being spoken around by the Romans, and, and the Hebrew is spoken in the synagogues. But the common people, they speak Aramaic. Jesus spoke Aramaic. When I was a missionary in, in Senegal, one of the things that, uh, you know, being a white guy, people would always start talking to me in French because French is the official language there, one of them. And they would always start this way, you know, with the patter or whatever. But if I wanted to get their attention, I wouldn't answer them in French. I would answer them in Wolof. See, Wolof is the language that actually Dakar was, which is the, um, which is the local dialect of Wolof is really what the people speak among themselves. And so when I would speak Wolof, everything changed. People would get quiet. People would listen to me. People would understand that I wasn't just some foreign guy here, some visitor. I was an insider. And that's exactly what's happening here. They're listening to Paul because he's an insider. Then Paul said, I'm a Jew. Born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but, listen, brought up in this city. In other words, he's from Jerusalem. He was brought up there. He says, I studied under Gamaliel and was thoroughly trained in the law of our ancestors. I was just as zealous for God as any of you are today. I persecuted the followers of this way to their death, arresting both men and women and throwing them into prison. As the high priest and all the council can themselves testify, the same high priest and council, by the way, he's standing in front of. 
I even obtained letters from them to their associates in Damascus and went there to bring these people as prisoners to Jerusalem to be punished. In other words, Paul is saying, I was a golden boy. Everybody loved me. All the leaders respected me and they gave me the power to do what I did. And now he's come home, the golden boy. But he's come home changed, right? He's no longer the guy that left. He's no longer the guy that they trusted to carry out their, their, their whims. Paul has been transformed by Jesus Christ. You see, Jesus rocked Paul's world. He rocked Paul's world. He, Paul ended up doing a total 160, or 180, excuse me. When I do the math thing. Total 180. Completely turned around by, by Jesus Christ. When God does that with us, when God gets a hold of our life, when Jesus comes into our lives, He completely changes us. He makes us different. We're a new creature in Christ. We're a different person. But the reality is this, people. You may be a new creature in Christ, but not everyone's going to like that. Not everyone in your circle of friends or in your family or in your neighborhood is going to like the fact that you're following Jesus. In fact, quite the opposite of it. Because once you get out of your bubble, once you get out of your little circle of friends who believe like you do, once you need to go out of these walls, you're going into enemy territory. Now, our enemy territory here in Edmond may not be the enemy territory that Paul is facing in Jerusalem. But I guarantee you there are enemies there, right? And as many of you can attest, you go back to your home country and you're going to face enemies as well. You're going to face people who, as you share the gospel of Jesus Christ, you're going to be shut down. At least they're going to try. The reality is, is not everyone's going to like the changes. Now, joy is the time for that video. Villagers in remote parts of Laos are paying a heavy price for following Christ. It can mean being rejected by family, friends, and community, losing income and education, and even their freedom. On a recent trip, we met a number of these brave believers, some of whom are just teenagers. Philip walked two hours to another village to hear the gospel. Just three weeks after he returned home as a new believer, the police paid him a visit. That was only the start of his troubles. Villagers killed his livestock and seized his land, forcing him to move to another community. There, the police tried to force him to sign a document to stop him evangelizing, but he refused. His children also faced discrimination at school. Why do you keep doing this if it's so difficult to be a Christian? Would you be willing to go back and face that level of persecution? 
where your family's harassed, where they take all of your property and they take it away. See, a lot of people pay a price much heavier than we pay. We may have people laugh at us. We may have people scorn us. There are people around the world that face an intense level of persecution because of what they believe. But the truth we must face, as we saw about Philip there, the truth we must face is this. Our enemies may be those closest to us. For Paul, his enemies were his own people. How many of those people in that council, in that crowd, had known Paul, had grown up with Paul? How many people had seen him in the other days? Were friends with him? And now, these familiar friends have become bitter enemies. Even Jesus faced familiar enemies, didn't he? Look at Matthew 13, 54 to 57. Coming to his hometown, Jesus, he began teaching the people in their synagogue. And they were amazed. Where did this man get this wisdom and these miraculous powers, they asked? Isn't this the carpenter's son? Isn't his mother's name Mary? And aren't his brothers James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas? Aren't all his sisters with us? Where did the, the, then did this man get all these things? And they took offense at him. But Jesus said to them, The prophet is not without honor, except in his own town, in his own home. Jesus understood this. He understood exactly what Paul was doing. Because he had faced it. He had faced that rejection. And even at one point in his ministry, even his own family was not on his side. Look at Mark 3, 20-21. It says, Then Jesus entered a house, and again a crowd gathered, so that he and his disciples were not even able to eat. 21 is coming, right? Yeah, right? When his family heard about this, they went to take charge of him, for they said, he's out of his mind. And his family thought he was crazy. They thought he was nuts. Right? It's hard to have it. To have your own family turn to But in fact, Jesus makes it clear that conflicts over the faith with those closest to us is normal. It's be expected. It's going to happen if we follow him. Matthew 10, 34 through 36. Do not suppose, Jesus is saying, that I've come to bring peace to the earth. I did not come to bring peace with a sword. For I have come to turn a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies will be the members of his own household. Tough words. Does that mean that God doesn't care about our families? That God's all about strife and everything else? No. Not if you look at it in context. Not if you look at the whole picture. What God is saying is, I am bringing you something very, very special. I am bringing you eternal life. I am giving you the opportunity to once again join with your Creator. But in doing so, you're going to cause waves. And in doing so, your family situation may very well suffer. Some of us are blessed by the fact that our family members are also Christians. But I don't know how many people I know who one person's a Christian and everybody else in the family is not. And the strife that comes from that is tough. In India, there's a lady named Preeti and her husband They're from a, a village there. And Preeti and her husband are about the only Christians in the area. And one day the, the villagers decided 
that they were going to have their, the, this festival there where they were praying to other gods and other spirits, and everyone was supposed to participate. The preeti and her husband said, we're well, sorry, we can't. We're Christians. Well, their neighbors are not going to accept that. And so about 30 or 40 of them came and they started attacking them. They, they grabbed Preeti and started beating her up. They started tearing her clothes off. And she was likely going to be raped. Thankfully, she, was man she managed to escape somehow. She managed to make it to another village to where she went into... Uh, well, first of all, she went into this one house. She escaped this one house. These people weren't Christians, but they still protected her. And they hit her for a while, and eventually she was able to go to another village where she got in with her pastor there and was able to stay there. A few days later, her husband, torn, bleeding, etc., managed to make it there as well. And they're scared to go home. This is recently. What was her crime? Following Jesus. I wish I could say the previous story was abnormal. It's not. Persecution for one's faith within one's own family and community is quite common all across the world. We just happen to be fortunate here. However, knowing our enemy well can work in our faith. Knowing our enemy well can work in our favor. You know, having lived a lot of my life overseas, one thing I've discovered about being a foreigner in another country, I don't care how many years you live there, you never fully understand the culture. You understand a lot. You never fully get it. There are people in this church, in the Chinese congregation, who have been here for decades. They've been here for a long time. And occasionally some of them will come to me and still ask questions like, why do Americans do this? Because they don't get it. Because it's not part of their culture. They didn't grow up with it. And they just don't understand it that way. Paul, though, had an intimate knowledge of the beliefs of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. He had an intimate knowledge of the beliefs of his own people. Right? Right? And he used that to his advantage. Look again in Acts 23, 6 to 8. It says, Then Paul, knowing that some of them were Sadducees and the others Pharisees, called out of the Sanhedrin, My brothers, I'm a Pharisee, descended from Pharisees. I stand on trial because of the hope of the resurrection of the dead. When he said this, a dispute broke out between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the assembly was divided. The Sadducees say there is no resurrection, there are neither angels nor spirits, but the Pharisees believe all these things. Basically, okay, he understood that the Sadducees were this elitist, sort of liberal, very, you know, oh, it's a cultural thing. We really don't believe that there's an afterlife. We don't believe that, you know, when we die, we go to heaven or something like that. We don't believe in angels or spirits. We just believe this is how we should live. The Pharisees, on the other hand, were the more conservative side. The Pharisees say, no, there's a heaven. Yes, that's where we're going, etc., etc., etc. Okay? Paul understands this. And Paul is able to interject something that's going to change the dynamics of the situation. He was able to play basically one group against the other. God may use us in situations where we can be instruments of change because of our, our, our basically our knowledge of those who are opposing the gospel. That does not mean we learn about a culture or whatever just to manipulate it. That doesn't mean that our purpose is somehow to be controlling. That just means that God uses insiders uses their inside knowledge to create change. Paul didn't want the Jews 
as enemies. In fact, he calls them brothers and he means it. We learn about cultures to minister to them, to relate to them. Because God is all about relationships as we've talked about and bringing others in. Despite being in enemy territory, Despite realizing there are people around us who disagree with us, we cannot see them as enemies. Hear me. We cannot see those around us who disagree with us as enemies. We need to see them as people who need Christ. We need to see the people who persecute us, the people who laugh at us, the people who scorn us as not the enemy but as lost brothers and sisters. As people who really need Jesus. We must shine our light and our hope in this dark world. But one thing we can also learn from this passage is that God is with us wherever we are, even in enemy territory. God will never leave us. He will never forsake us. He is the ultimate dad, the ultimate father, the ultimate one there for us. God is with us wherever we go. Look at Psalms 139, 7 to 12. A few weeks ago, I think we looked at some of this, but I want to look at it again. Where it says, Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you're there. If I make my bed in the depths, you're there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light become night around me, even the darkness will not be too dark for you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light. Think about that. God is everywhere. God is always with you. No matter in the darkest places, God sees you. But not only is He with us, He's also there to help us and to help us followers when times get tough. Psalms 46 1 says this God is our refuge and strength in ever present health and trouble. And as we serve Him in the work He's called us to, He promises to always be there. Matthew 28, 19 and 20. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you, and listen to this, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. No matter where we go, no matter how we serve Him, God is always with us. In the darkest places, in enemy territory, and it seems there's no way out. God is with us. Maybe you're in a situation where you see no light at the end of the tunnel. You're in a situation where it just seems dark. Maybe you're in a place where there's not very many friends around you. God sees you. God knows where you are. And He's always, always there for you. Our biggest problem is we tend to ignore the fact that He's there. We tend to try to do things on our own. And people, that's not how we were designed. We were designed for God. By Him and to be used by Him. And He loves us. So our, as we close, our cardinal question is this. Will you stand or fall in enemy territory? As, as you walk out of this door, 
And you go out into enemy territory, even though it may not be as rough as we've said as others. Will you stand up for Jesus or will you fall? Will people be able to look at your life and will they say, that's a Christian? Or will you fall into the normal pattern of everyone else? It's not what we're designed for. We're to make a difference. We're to be salt and light. We're to be missionaries in the world, whether it's foreign seas or in our own communities, our own families. We are the sent ones, sent to reach others for Christ. Like Paul, we may someday, someday face friends and family who have become enemies. Will you stand for Christ? There's no better friend. Father God, we want to thank you that you're always there for us. And Lord, when we are facing our enemies, when we are in times where people don't understand us, people will crush us or try to, people don't want to hear what we have to say. Father, you are always there with us. Lord, help us to be bold. Help us to be willing to stand up for what we believe. Lord, you, you say that if we deny you, you'll deny us before the Father. Help us not to be that way. Help us instead to have the courage to live our faith out loud. In Christ's name. We do have a couple of minutes, and we were talking in the leadership council. We we're talking about different things that we want to do. And one of the things we want to do is.